Ogenis Vonderplanitz, American actor, author, and nutritionist who died in 2013, was famous for eating a diet consisting of raw and sometimes rotten animal foods, which he called the primal diet. Vonderplanitz claimed raw meat and other animal foods eaten raw were healthier than when cooked, and he even credited his diet for curing of multiple terminal cancers. For decades, a number of movie stars and bodybuilders have been eating raw eggs as part of their diets, based on the belief that raw eggs are healthier and easier to digest. It's time to settle the debate once and for all using anthropological and scientific evidence to answer the question, are meat, eggs, and other animal proteins healthier when eaten raw, or are they healthier when cooked? All right, today's presentation I have titled Raw Meat versus Cooked Meat. The information contained within it comes largely from the book Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human by Richard Wrangham. Now I must start by saying, since we're talking about raw versus cooked meat, when we're talking about raw and cooked meat, the only type of meat we're talking about here is pastured meat. And this is the only type of meat you should be eating, by the way. I just want to quickly go over the difference between the two types of meat, the two types of livestock management, and their impacts on you and the environment. So corn-fed meat, most of the stuff you get from the store, destroys topsoil, pollutes waterways, it's a highly toxic food, the animals raised in this way, is, it's highly cruel to them, and it also destroys the environment. <clears throat> Pastured meat, conversely, this is when you have animals out on green, lush grass in their natural habitat, and where they eat and excrete in the same place, this builds topsoil, provides habitat for everything from bacteria, they're said to be one billion bacteria within a single tablespoon of topsoil, which is destroyed in conventional agriculture, by the way. Pasture meat provides life and habitat for those bacteria, the nematodes, other microorganisms, to the insects, to the rodents, to grazing animals and birds, all these things. It provides habitat for wildlife as opposed to destroying habitat like conventional agriculture does. Pastured animals or livestock have great lives. So this type of production produces great lives for the animals. You have to remember that these animals can't survive on their own, so you're giving them amazing lives and they have one bad day where the nutrients they've accumulated come to us and the nutrient cycle continues. Now also, the food provided by pastured animals is extremely nutritious. I don't know if you know this, but grass is the most nutritious food in the world, probably only second to algae. And the only reason that would be is because they probably have more access to all the nutrients and the minerals when soils have typically been at least a little bit depleted if not extremely depleted. If you try to eat grass, you can, but you'll die. Ruminant animals can eat grass and they convert it into delicious fat and protein. So the nutrients from the healthiest plant go to the cow and their tissues accumulate all the nutrients that they, they've eaten and they literally eat for like 12 hours a day. Pastured meat improves the environment. So there's this myth out there that humans are negative to the environment and we can't have a positive impact. But the truth is our impact on the environment can be just as positive as it is negative. And the way we do this is by supporting and buying and eating pastured poultry, beef, lamb. If you don't have a freezer full of pastured meat, visit eatwild.com. I have no affiliation with them, but they are an amazing directory of farmers that produce pastured and other different types of meat and poultry and things. Visit that website, contact a local farmer, phone them, email them, and buy a half cow and load up your freezer with this stuff. Now that this is out of the way, here is the subject at hand. The age old question, which is healthier, raw meat or cooked meat? And for this presentation, we're going to explore two types of evidence. One is anthropological, or the study of past civilization that's sometimes present, but indigenous people who live off the land and are generally hunter-gatherers. How did they live? That's learning through experience like that is the most effective way to learn. So they know what they're doing. The other type of evidence we're going to look at is scientific evidence. And there's been a lot of very interesting research in recent years that can give us some clues and some solid evidence that can help us in establishing whether raw meat or cooked meat is healthier. So, part one, anthropology. What we know from the study of anthropology is that no hunter-gatherer cultures ate raw food diets. Plutarch, as well as colonial sailors of the 19th century, have made claims that there were cultures that didn't cook their food. 
1870, anthropologist Edward Taylor examined these claims to determine if they were true or not and found no evidence of cultures eating purely raw food diets. Now, some, some cultures did eat certain foods raw, and we'll get to that, but no cultures ate purely raw food diets. It's important to note. Taylor concluded that cooking was practiced by every known human society. A study of the Copper Inuit found that the Copper Inuit ate almost all cooked meat. In 1906, polar explorer Wilhelmer Stephenson conducted a series of expeditions in Canada's Northwest Territories and found the Copper Inuit diet was virtually plant-free, dominated by seal and caribou meat, and supplemented with large salmon-like fish and occasional whale meat. Stephenson found that for the Copper Inuit, cooking was the nightly norm and that meat was always well cooked. Here's a, here's a quote from Stephenson in 1910. I have never seen Eskimo eat partly cooked meat so bloody as many steaks I have seen devoured in cities. When they cook, they usually cook well. That being said, there were some foods that the Copper Inuit ate raw, some by preference, some by convenience, and we're going to go over those now. First, the foods they ate by preference, foods that the Copper Inuit preferred to eat raw, included soft animal foods including whale blubber, because it was so soft that it could be spread over meat like butter. They also ate raw seal and caribou livers and kidneys. Now, there were foods that they ate by convenience. Inuit consumed food raw mostly as a snack while away from the camp while hunting because cooking would be really difficult. So when, one of the things that they ate for convenience raw was fresh fish, and another one was raw, rotten, high fish. So they would catch some of their fish and then bury it underground for a period of months or even years. And they would remember where they buried it and return to it months or years later and eat it. And it'd be raw and putrid and rotten. There were many other cultures that ate things, foods raw as well. And we're going to go over a few of those now. Australian Aborigines ate raw mangrove worms. They never cooked their worms. <laughs> raw fruit, turtle eggs, oysters, and witchetty grubs. The last three I must mention, they ate sometimes raw and sometimes cooked. The turtle eggs, oysters, and witchetty grubs. The Yagan tribe of Tierra del Fuego ate raw winkles, which was a mollusk, and raw sea urchins. The UTs of Colorado ate the raw kidneys and livers of land animals. The Copper Inuit that we just mentioned ate raw whale blubber, raw seal liver and kidney, and raw caribou liver. And the Maasai in Africa, who are still doing their thing to this day, eat a mixture of raw blood and milk as their staple food. And if you're watching the video now, you can see a photograph of the Maasai mixing the blood and milk together and pouring it into a cup, preparing to drink it. As Richard Wrangham wrote, the Inuit probably ate more raw animal products than other societies, but like every culture, the main meal of the day was taken in the evening and it was cooked. Now, that being said, there were cultures that never ate raw meat. The Siriono hunter-gatherers of Bolivia were one example. In the 1940s, anthropologist Alan Holmberg discovered that the Siriono had a taboo against eating raw meat, which they claimed not to eat under any circumstances. Three other tribes that never ate raw meat were the Andaman Islanders, the Mbuti, and the Kalahari San. That's it for the anthropological evidence. Now we're going to move on to the modern scientific evidence section for raw versus cooked meat and see what we can find out. Let's start with eggs. In the past, raw eggs were claimed to be the ideal source of calories. In 1904, Molly and Eugene Christian wrote, an egg should never be cooked. In its natural state, it's easily dissolved and readily taken up by all the organs of digestion. But the cooked egg must be brought back to liquid form before it can be digested. This concept persuaded many bodybuilders and this concept persuaded many bodybuilders and actors to eat raw eggs, including Steve Reeves, who famously played Hercules in the 1950s and ate raw eggs every day for breakfast. Arnold Schwarzenegger drank eggs mixed with heavy cream. And Sylvester Stallone swallowed raw eggs in the movie Rocky. I think in a few of the Rocky movies, actually. So, the question is, are raw eggs better than cooked eggs? Just because these bodybuilders and actors did it, does that mean they're better? Not necessarily. Let's take a look at some studies to see what we can find out. Turns out in 1998 there was a Bulgarian study on raw eggs. 
the scientists conducted a study to find out how much protein is absorbed from eating raw eggs versus cooked eggs. Participants ate about four raw or cooked eggs, containing a total of about 25 grams of protein. And what did they find out? In the participants who ate the cooked eggs, they absorbed 91 to 94 percent of the protein in the eggs. And of the participants who ate the raw eggs, they absorbed 65 percent of the protein. That means just by cooking the eggs, the people who ate the cooked eggs absorbed, on average, almost 30 percent more protein. Now we have another study that was done in 1987 where researchers tested the degradation of the protein bovine serum albumin by the enzyme trypsin with and without heat. So in samples of cooked bovine serum albumin, digestion by the enzyme trypsin increased four times to that of the uncooked samples. So cooking the bovine serum albumin protein made it four times more digestible. What are the mechanisms behind this? That's what we're going to explore now. The Belgian scientists in the previous study concluded the major reason for the dramatic increase in nutritional absorption caused by cooking was the denaturation of proteins induced by heat. The same phenomenon occurred, of course, in the 1987 study. And a lot of people think the word denaturation, it doesn't sound like a positive thing. A lot of people have used that word as a way or reason not to eat cooked meat and a reason to eat your meat raw. But in reality, denaturation is a very natural process, as we're going to explore soon. So the two mechanisms behind the increased absorption of protein from cooked meat versus raw. Number one, cooking denatures proteins. And number two, cooking softens connective tissues. And we're going to go over both of those quickly now. So number one, cooking denatures proteins. Denaturing protein exposes it to the action of enzymes. So essentially, heat weakens the molecular bonds of a protein, causing it to open up so enzymes can break down the rest into smaller fragments. There are other ways to denature protein. One, of course, we know is heat. Another is salt. So a lot of meats are like salt cured. So you get like beef jerky and pepperettes and things like this are cured with salt. And that actually helps to denature the protein and make it more, more digestible. Another way is drying, which also pepperettes and beef jerky are usually, they're definitely also dried in addition to their salting. So both of those things help denature the protein and make it more digestible. If you're still not convinced that denaturing is a good thing, uh, just keep in mind that acidity is the fourth and other way to denature protein. And if you think about your stomach during digestion, your stomach produces hydrochloric acid specifically for that purpose, to denature protein. So if you can do it outside your body before you eat it, that makes it even more efficient because cooking can actually reach the interior a lot easier than putting it in an ac a chunk of meat in an acid bath. It's more thorough a way of denaturing the protein. So cooking then is a way to pre-digest food outside your body to make the entire process of digestion easier and more efficient. And number two, as far as the mechanisms of why cooking makes um, proteins more digestible as opposed to eating them raw, is that cooking softens connective tissues. And we're going to have to look a little bit at the anatomy of muscle here, which is fascinating. It's complex, but fascinating. And for those watching the video, you see a diagram. For those listening to the podcast, I'm going to do my best to describe this for you, and I hope it comes out clear. I'll do my best. Here we go. The material in meat most responsible for its toughness is connective tissue. So connective tissue is composed of a fibrous protein called collagen and a stretchy protein called elastin. Connective tissue wraps meat in three layers. So if you think of like a your bicep, that is comprised of three essential sheaths wrapped around muscle fibers and groups of muscle fibers. So there are three layers here. So if you think of a single muscle fiber, just a thin, small muscle fiber, each muscle fiber in your muscle is wrapped in a fibrous protein, collagen and elastin called endomycium. Each muscle fiber wrapped in endomycium. And then there's a bundle of those muscle fibers wrapped in endomycium, wrapped around another collagenous sheath called paramycium. So bundles of a mycium are enclosed in muscle fibers jointly sheathed within the paramycium. And then thirdly, the third wrapping is that you have a bunch of paramecium, which wrap the endomecium, wrapping muscle fibers, <laughs> are wrapped in epimycium. So a bunch of paramecium 
the bundles of muscle fibers are wrapped in epimesium, and that encloses the entire muscle. Those bundles are held together by the outer wrapping called the epimesium, which encloses the entire muscle. And at the end of the muscle, the epimesium actually turns into the tendon. So that is what a muscle is made of. And not surprisingly, that material, the sheath, the, coll the collagen and elastin, is what's most responsible for the toughness in meat. And in fact, the tensile strength of tendons can be half that of aluminum, which is a metal. So you have the tendons in your body and the, the sheaths wrapping your muscle, individual fibers and bundles of fibers and bundles of bundles of fibers. These are half the strength of aluminum, incredibly strong. And that explains why it is so difficult to digest raw meat and why it's not as efficient. And amazingly, Tendons are indeed bioengineering marvels, and in fact, they make excellent bowstrings. If you're watching the screen now, as opposed to listening on the podcast, you are looking at some classic indigenous bowstrings, which are used are using tendons as the actual strings. So these bow and arrows and crossbows use tendons as their bowstrings. That's how strong these things are. But amazingly, collagen has an Achilles heel or a kryptonite. Heat turns collagen to jelly. And now the collagen denaturation temperature to turn it to jelly is 60 to 70 degrees Celsius or 140 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. Now let's just recap quickly here before we move on. Cooking meat increases the amount of protein energy you get from your food. It does this by denaturing proteins and softening connective tissues. But there's one more way that cooking makes digestion and absorption of energy more efficient. Cooking decreases the energy it takes to digest your food. Physiological ecologist Stephen Secor conducted a study using Burmese pythons. Burmese pythons are the ideal subject for testing the effects of cooking on the cost of digestion because after swallowing a meal, they essentially just lie in a cage and do almost nothing but digest and breathe. So it's easy then to measure the energy that they use to digest that food, you know, various foods that they're given. So in this study by Stephen Secor, he, they used eight Burmese pythons, and they were fed five different kinds of experimental diets containing lean beefsteak. The five different types of diets were raw and intact, raw and ground, cooked and intact, cooked and ground, and whole live rat. And the results were as follows. In the raw and intact and the whole and intact rat, cost of digestion was the same. And that's not too surprising. The biggest difference came when they fed them cooked and intact and raw and ground. Cooking, it turns out, reduced the cost of digestion by 12.7%. And grinding apparently is another method to denature proteins and make digestion more efficient because grinding reduced the cost of digestion by 12.3%, almost as much as cooking. It turns out grinding breaks up both muscle fibers and connective tissue, so it increases the surface area of the digestible parts of meat and exposes it to acid and enzymes for digestion. Last but not least, cooked and ground. Both cooking and grinding together reduce the cost of digestion by 23.4%. So it's almost independent of one another. If you do both cooking and grinding, it adds together and reduces the cost of digestion almost double. So the cost of digestion by cooking and grinding your meat, so eating cooked ground beef, is very efficient for absorption and utilization of the proteins. That will reduce the amount of energy your body needs to digest it by 23.4%. Now, this is incredible. The, if you haven't heard of the Alexa St. Martin story, this is mind-blowing. Get ready to have your mind blown. On June 6th, 1822, 28-year-old Alexis St. Martin was accidentally shot from a distance of about, of about three feet inside a store of the American Fur Company at Fort Mackinac, Michigan in the United States. Surgeon William Beaumont arrived on the bloody scene and said the following when describing what he saw. A large portion of his side was blown off, the ribs fractured, and openings made into the cavities of the chest and abdomen, through which protruded portions of the lung and stomach, much lacerated and burnt, exhibiting altogether an appalling and hopeless case. The diaphragm was lacerated and perforation made directly into the cavity of the stomach, through which food was escaping at the time your memorialist was called to his relief. If you're watching the video, you see a photo on the screen now of a reconstruction of the torso 
by artist Michael Schultz, 2017. So it's a sculpture of the reconstruction, and you see the, the blast hole on the side of his torso. After the accident, Beaumont took St. Martin to his home and nursed him back to health, and he went on to live a vigorous life, which included paddling his family in a canoe from Mississippi to Montreal. Although the fist-sized wound mostly filled in, it never completely healed. For the rest of his life, St. Martin's insides were visible from the outside. A horrendous thing to have to live with, but for Beaumont, this meant an extraordinary study opportunity. For the first time in history, it was possible to watch digestion taking place. So, for the next eight years, Beaumont experimented by inserting foods into St. Martin's stomach through the opening attached to a string, and he observed its effects on digestion. He did many different experiments. One thing he did was record how long it took foods to be digested by the stomach and emptied into the duodenum, and from these observations, he drew conclusions in relation to the effects of cooking. When Beaumont introduced boiled beef and raw beef at noon, the boiled beef was gone by 2 p.m., and the piece of raw, salted, lean beef of the same size was only slightly digested on the surface, while the rest remained firm and intact. After eight years of study on this poor guy, St. Martin, Beaumont's conclusions were, the more tender the food and the more finely divided, the more rapidly and completely it was digested. Hmm, sound familiar? Here's actually a quote from Dr. William Beaumont on his research. Fibrin and gelatin, which are muscle fibers and collagen in meat, are affected in the same way. If tender and finely divided, they are disposed of readily. If in large, solid masses, digestion is proportionately retarded. Minuteness of division and tenderness of fiber are the two grand essentials for speedy and easy digestion. Now, this story did not end well at all. Sadly, by the time St. Martin died in 1880, at 85 years old, he felt mistreated and was resentful of being the subject of all this experimentation. Neither he nor his family wanted anything to do with Beaumont. After St. Martin's death, Dr. William Osler, described by many as the father of modern medicine, offered to buy his stomach for further study, but the family refused. The family actually kept the body privately for a number of days to ensure it rotted, ended up burying it in an unusually deep grave to ensure nobody could get to it. I think we owe it to St. Martin to justify his lifetime of suffering by learning from the experiments done on him after his unfortunate accident by applying the knowledge to our lives. So we're gonna make some conclusions now about this project or this presentation. But first, it's really important to note the damaging effects or the cost of burning meat. So when you burn or char meat, a number of toxic substances are formed called myelard compounds, such as acrylamide or heterocyclic amines. These compounds are formed essentially by the unions of sugar and protein in meat, mainly the amino acid lysine. In his book, Richard Rangham stated, their presence is easily recognized in the brown colors found in pork crackling or bread crust. So it's not just meat, it's on any food, and these things need to be avoided. So when we're talking about cooked meat, so long as we avoid burning it, creating these toxic compounds, we can deduce a couple of things about cooking versus raw. Cooking reduces the amount of time and energy your body spends digesting meat. And number two, cooking meat increases the amount of energy you obtain from meat. And therefore, we can now say, based on anthropological and scientific evidence, with certainty that cooked meat is healthier than raw meat. If you enjoyed this presentation and want to support my work, I have three books available, one on red light therapy, another on the cancer industry, and another on cancer as a metabolic disease, all bestsellers on Amazon right now. I also sell red light therapy devices. If you want to check out my books, red light therapy devices, or donate to the show, or also see all the show notes, you can look at this presentation, the video, the podcast, and the transcribed article. Go to the show notes page. I've created a special link that will take you directly to it. Go to endalldisease.com slash episode five. That's endalldisease.com slash E-P-I-S-O-D-E and the number five. I want to thank you again for watching. Until next time, goodbye and God bless.